Warning. Listening to this show may result in increased levels of inspiration, motivation, and innovation. Side effects can include the immediate urge to take massive action to build a better business and life for yourself and others. You've been warned. Welcome to Influencers Radio with your host, Jack Mize. And welcome back to another episode of Influencers Radio. You know, looking back at history and seeing how the the agricultural and the industrial revolution, um, you know, and you find the innovators that created huge advancements in the world, the the, the Andrew Carnegies with railroads and steel, the the John D. Rockefellers with oil, uh, Tesla to a great extent with electricity, and really what it is is these guys are they're the folks that were willing to explore the unknown. They took chances, they tried and failed. Uh, tried and failed until they succeeded. And once they found that success, uh, they brought back a map. And those maps have changed the way that people live, and it's allowed us to evolve. Now, you fast forward, we're really still in the cradle of the Internet revolution, especially as it relates to commerce. You know, it's hard to believe that that uh, YouTube is only 11 years old. Facebook's only 12 years old. Uh, Amazon is actually the ancient, uh, of the, uh, of all of them at 22 years old. Only 22 years old. And that's uh, one of the, the oldest that people can think of off the top of their head in e-commerce. Well, today my guest is a guy that I would certainly put in the category of innovators in the digital e-commerce revolution that is happening today. Uh, you know, he's launched his first web-based business from his college dorm room in 1999. And since that time, he's founded over 40 different businesses, uh, partnered in dozens more in markets such as health and beauty, survival and preparedness, uh, do-it-yourself crafts, home improvement, investing, finance, chemical. I mean, the, the, the list goes on uh, and on. And in fact, you know, over the last 36 months, him and his team have invested over $15 million on marketing test, generated tens of millions of unique visitors, and have sent well over a billion, with a B, permission-based emails. Uh, and they run uh, approximately 3,000 split and multivariant tests along with that. So he definitely knows a thing or two about marketing and selling online. He is among other things, the CEO of DigitalMarketer.com. So with that, please welcome to Influencers Radio, Mr. Ryan Dice. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for the uh, warm introduction. Well, I got to say that um, for, you, you've been there from the beginning. We, we talk about the advancements and uh, an evolution that occurred in e-commerce over the last 10 years. It's It's staggering. Um, and there's no way, like I t- said at the top of the show, that this can occur without guys like you taking chances to figure it out. Uh, but more importantly, to be willing and able to bring back that map. And you've certainly created a, a pretty extensive uh, a map. So could you take us back to 1999 and tell us about that kid, Ryan Dice, that decided he was going to start a business on the web? Sure. Uh, it, at the time, I wasn't thinking anything about starting a business on the web. I was just thinking about making some extra money. Um, I'd met a girl my freshman year, uh, knew pretty early on that she was, you know, likely the girl that I was going to marry. And I've always been a planner my whole life. I remember when I was 12, you know, my dad's like, hey, you're going to turn 16 in a few years. You might want to start saving up for the car. Um, and, and so when I, by the time I turned 16, I'd saved up enough money uh, to, to, buy a, to buy a car. And, and you know, I, I thought about the same thing with a diamond ring, right? Like I need to start saving for this thing. Um, you know, cause I think this is the one I want to be clear. I didn't tell her within a couple of weeks that I thought I was going to marry her. That's a little creepy, but, um, but I, but I did get motivated, right? I, you know, I was, you know, I was a poor broke college kid. Not that there's some rags to riches story. You're supposed to be poor and broke, you know, broken college. Um, but I was a full-time student. I had a part-time job to, to pay the rent and stuff like that, but extra money wasn't just falling, uh, you know, falling out, out of trees. So I was looking around at what can I do? You know, I can't really work and go, go get another job. Um, I was looking around, at, you know, like you said, 1999, this is when the dot com boom was reaching its uh, pinnacle right before the uh, bust that was soon to follow. But I was like, you know what? I think maybe I can start a dot com. You know, nobody said I'm going to start an online business. Nobody said I'm going to start a dot com. And, 
so I, I, I started uh, looking around at what are the different things that, you know, that I could, that I could sell funny enough. I've, I've never really, I don't think I told this story before, but to make extra money, I started doing a little web design work. And, um, and one of my first clients was a lactation consultant, uh, which if you know what that is, it can be a little bit weird, you know, as a 19 year old, you know, college kid, uh, creating a website for a lactation consultant and your friends think that you're into some really kind of weird stuff. But, uh, you know, so I'm building all this website with like breast pumps and, you know, <laughs> different things that lactation, and if you don't know what lactation consultant is, it's obviously, it's a, it's a, you know, medical person that helps with, with breastfeeding and all that. Um, so I'm building the site and, and she wound up not paying me. Right. And, and so I'm like, okay, well that, that's a bummer. Um, but one of the, she said, look, I'm sorry, I can't pay you. You know, you, I guess you can have the site. Like, what do I need with the site? But one of the things that I created for her was I had this little ebook produced on how to make your own baby food. And I thought, you know, I wonder if somebody will buy this. So I built a simple little website, um, put the, you know, put the products up for sale. This when PayPal was brand spanking new. I mean, brand spanking new. This was almost pre ClickBank. Um, and, and other forms of payment processing. And I had sold this little ebook on how to make your own baby food, uh, optimized it, you know, for, to rank high in Alta Vista because Google wasn't really a thing yet. Um, and, uh, you know, to much to my surprise, I started making a couple of sales uh, and then, and then a few more. And then I said, wow, we should do this again. And so I started off doing really digital publishing uh, before Kendall and, and then got into, you know, started trying my hand at physical products, which was tough because, you don't have a lot of warehouse space when you're in college. Uh, so mostly stuck to digital and software and things like that. But that's, that's how I got started. It was just not trying to start a business. You know, I was still planning on graduating, getting a job. I just needed a way to make some extra money. Um, I'm glad it worked out. Well, yeah. Well, I think that there's a, lots of people out there that are glad it worked out uh, because, uh, you know, it definitely was a seed that, that has affected a lot of people's lives. You know, I think the ironic thing, you talked about the Internet, uh, the dot-com uh boom and bust. I think the dot-com bust was actually the beginning of the e-commerce boom for the little guy. Uh, you had all the big companies throwing stupid money at stuff that they didn't understand, I think. Um, and then the little guy, like you, was able to take advantage of this this uh, um, platform or, you know, this this fabric that has been built up by all this stupid money to be able to uh, start a business selling an, an e-book. What I've noticed with with online marketing is that there's core questions that have been there from the beginning and will probably always been there. And it kind of reminds me of a story I'll tell real quick about when Einstein was teaching at Har uh, no, Princeton, I believe, in, and uh, he gave the same test two, two years in a row. And his assistant said, how can you give the same class the, the, the same test two years in a row? And he said, it's okay, the answers have changed. And it, and it seems like that's what happens, happens with marketing. The core questions are, how do I get traffic? You know, how do I convert that traffic into a sale? And, and to a certain extent, how do I f fulfill that sale? So those questions have remained, but the answers seem to constantly change. And you seem to be kind of on the, the cutting edge of what those new answers are. And hopefully you'll reveal some of those, uh, uh here, uh, today. But, you know, as digital economy advances, those answers, uh, uh, seems to change. How do you keep up with that? Yeah, I'll be the first to admit that I got, I got lucky. Um, you know, when I first started building, building web pages um, to, to sell things, everybody at the time was doing these like splash intros. Do you remember that? You'd go to a website and all of a sudden like there was all this swirly stuff. And that's what everybody did because it was cool. And so everybody's like, Ooh, that's cool. And, and so they wanted to do, well, I didn't know how to do that. And so my pages were all very simple. You know, usually I was building them in, in a pirated version of, you know, Microsoft front page, if I'm being totally honest, right? You know, a student version, and my license would expire. And it's like, oh, what am I going to do? I'm broke, right? Um, I did go back, by the way, and purchase all the software I had previously acquired through less ethical means. But, uh, you know, but I'm, here I'm using Microsoft front page, right? There's, you can't do any fanciness there. I mean, in general, I had a table with a, you know, a headline with bigger words and body copy with smaller words and a button at the bottom. Now, I didn't do that because... I tested it and, and that's what worked better. I did it because it's all I knew how to do. Now it just so happened that that also is what tested better. And, and I think that a lot of the, you know, whether you call it evolution or, you know, revolution, what, 
typically is happening is we start off at, and, and, and I know this, the more successful you get, the more arrogant you get, the more you start doing things for your own pride and status, the more you start doing things to, to, uh, to benefit, not your customers, but you know, your peers and stakeholders. Um, and so you start doing things because they're cool or you start doing things because they're new. And, and this is what you saw at the beginning of the dot of the dot com era, you know, at the beginning of e-commerce, right? People doing things and never asking the customers, well, what do you actually want? Or never testing and finding out what are they responding best to? And I, I found it fascinating over the last few years, everybody's kind of realized that these very simple, you know, usually single column, you know, web pages, even with e-commerce items, uh, are even with physical products, right? Are, are typically what perform the best. There's no magic there. Right. If you understand how humans work and, and how we and how we want to buy, um, it, it makes all the sense in the world. So I think what it is and, and, and the big if, if you do this, then I think you'll be fine no matter what change occurs. If you decide today that your business is not defined by the product you sell and your business is not defined by the way you sell it, your business is defined by who you serve. If you have a customer centric business then that's how you keep from going out of style. If you have a customer centric business, then that's how you keep from chasing shiny objects because all you're chasing is, you know, really the kind of a shiny, you know, glint in your customer's eye. And the, and the example that I get for this, you know, all the time is, um, is, is Chanel, right? So Coco Chanel uh, came out and, and essentially invented the little black dress right? If you watch Breakfast at Tiffany's and all this stuff, right? Like this idea of the little black dress essentially was created by Coco Chanel. Now, Chanel is known today as a worldwide brand. I mean, it's, you know, Chanel purse is going to cost 10 grand depending on the size, right? So Chanel is no, is no longer defined by the little black dress, but she could have been, you know, the brand could have been, she could have said, you know what, this little black dress thing is working. Everybody wants to buy this. We need to double down on this particular tactic, on this particular thing, because you know this is this this is what's working, and we're going to define the business by the product we sell. And whether it was you know intentional or or, or accidental, but to you know her great credit and the credit of those who came to run the company afterwards, they said no, no, no. Our business is not defined by the product we sell, i.e., the little black dress. Our business is defined by the woman we serve, and that's why Chanel today is a you know, multinational, incredibly valuable, uh, multi-generational brand. Compare that to the piano key tie, right? And the, the poor dad that came out with the piano key tie back in the 1980s, right? Now that's a business that was largely dis- defined by, you know, by the product. And that's when you get these one hit wonders. That's when you get these people that, that come up and they flare out. It usually isn't a problem of imagination. It usually is a problem that they limited you know, what they did. We've seen this a lot in the digital marketing space and with, with information, you know, people selling information products and doing, and doing product launches, right? I think product launches are great, you know, and I speak of more of like Jeff Walker's product launch formula, something I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. But people who chose to define their business by that one particular selling model found at different times that it was less and less effective. It, when instead they should have been defining their business by the market that they serve, by the person that they serve, changing to their whims and wishes, right? And and understanding that you need to earn it every single day. You know, and, and you bring up a good point. I want to make sure and put a spotlight on this because it's something that you've been pretty firm on uh, for quite some time, just like you mentioned. Um, and, and I'll quote you. You say, the fact is most businesses define themselves by the product they sell, like you just talked about. And, 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 um, you uh, talk about why that's a huge mistake, just with the example you gave with uh, Chanel. But it seems like that's what people continue to do. They, they continue to, to neglect or ignore that uh, uh, principle in, th- in that they do focus on that, uh, that product. And when you started out, it sounds like you may have focused on the product when you so- sold ebooks and, and whatnot. At what, at what point did that, that snap to you? At what point did you get that V8 moment that said, ah, here's where I'm going wrong? Because I know there's a lot of people that, that are in that grind trying to figure out what is going wrong. I've got this great, great product, but what's happening? 
Yeah, and let me just first say that that I get it. Like I understand if you're if you're a creator, right? Whether whether you're um, whether you're in manufacturing or you're an author or you're a teacher um, or or you know you're a product manager, right? You're creating product, you're building brand, you're merchandising. And I think it, anytime you're in any type of creative role, it's very easy to fall in love with your creation. And it's very easy to get myopic in that. And so we have to constantly remind ourselves and have people around us reminding ourselves and really institutionalize this notion that no, 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 you know, we are not, you know, we are not here to be, to be artists um, just doing whatever we want to do in the hopes that people buy. That's a model. Uh, you know, there are people that, that, that do it, but it, I don't think it's a sustainable business model. So, but I understand why it happens. Um, the reason, frankly, that it didn't happen with me early on is because the product that I started with, I had no passion or enthusiasm about, you know, and, and, and then I saw like, wow, this is actually working. You know, I'm generating some revenue. Um, will this work? You know, will this work again? So you can be passionate about two things, either the product or the process. Um, and I think that if, if you are passionate, so again, getting back to, you know, defining your business by what you sell, i.e. the product or the way you sell it, the process, you know, I could have gotten really passionate about eBooks. Um, but it, I, what I did is I listened to the customers and when the customer said, well, do you, you know, do you also sell this? If it was outside of my normal process, but they were asking for it. I usually said, yes, you know, now this is going to add certain complexities and things like that, but my customers are asking me for it. So I'm going to figure out how we're going to get it, you know, for them. And, and, and I'm going to be willing to do the work, even if that means that I don't get to go kick it on the beach this week, you know, I'm going to be willing to do the work probably in the beginning when I was saying yes, I was saying yes, because I wanted and needed the money. Um, but today you know, really, we say all the time, like, if our people are asking for it, we should figure out a way to get it for them. So it's very easy to fall in love with, with the product. It's very easy to fall in love with the process. I get it. And I think it's important to be passionate about one of the two, but don't turn passion and, and take it to the next level and, and make that the definition of your business. It should be the thing that drives you, but not necessarily the thing that defines you. And I think that's one thing. People step back and look. Some of the most successful marketers are exactly that. They're marketers. There's a, there are a few steps removed from the product that they're selling as far as their, their uh, I guess, emo emotional connection to it. And one of the things that I think a lot of people may not realize, you know, um, and I mentioned a few of them, but, you, you know, you've been involved with business, uh, chemical and liquid filter manufacturing, business lending, uh, menswear, um, you, you know, things that people probably don't associate when they think of Ryan Dice uh, automatically associate you with. Do you think it's it's easier when you can have that non I guess, biased uh, look at when you're looking as a marketing purist versus trying to uh, understand too deeply about the product? Yeah, I mean, I never, I've never defined myself as a marketer. You know, other people have. And, and I've allowed it to persist because in many respects, it's convenient. Um, I've always seen myself as a business person. You know, and, and I remember, um, you know, a lot of people that I, I very much, you know, know and respect who they would define their business as, oh, I'm in information marketing, or I'm an info product seller, or I'm in the coaching business, or I'm in this business. I think you have to be very, very careful with how narrowly you define who you are and what you do. You know, and instead, when, when, when people are like, oh, so you, you sell information products. No, I'm in the publishing business. The publishing business is a giant industry. Oh, you're, oh you're, you have blogs? No, no, we have a media company, right? And, and so I think you have to be careful um, about how you define yourself and how you allow other people to define you. I'm, I'm good at marketing. Um, it, it's, a, it's a skill of mine, but I've always considered myself to be a business person, right? I'm a person who um, launches and, and grows businesses. That's, that's really what I enjoy. Uh, and over the years, my skills have had to have had to shift more. You know, I now do less marketing today and a lot more management and and other other forms of business, right? And, and so, again, it has to do. I think had I define myself as oh, I'm a marketer, then that becomes the hammer and everything else becomes a nail. If you say I'm a business person who's really good at marketing, 
then you know you, you kind of can can broaden your view just a little bit and not get so narrow. And I think that's the general theme of a lot of what we're talking about, right? Being really careful and intentional about your definitions. Careful of how you define your business. Are you defining it by the product or the you know process when you should be defining it by the people you serve? Careful about you know who you are. You know, are you um, are you a business owner? Are you an executive? Are you a marketer? And there's nothing wrong with the answer that you come up with. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with saying, yeah, it's my company, but I want to focus on marketing and hire somebody else to be, you know, the the person that runs it. There's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure that you're intentional about it. Be very intentional about your definitions. So given that, that you are a business person who happens to be really good at marketing, um, and that's what a lot of people come to learn from you about uh, marketing. One of the things that I think a lot of people either confused about or especially people that are new to business kind of um, get mixed up is is marketing versus uh, the mechanics of of e-commerce, right? You, you gave a great talk at uh, Traffic Inc. Version, which I should mention is an event that you host, huge event that you host uh, each year. I've been going there since the Austin days. Um, you gave a great talk at Traffic Inc. Version. I th- it was either last year or the year before on the psychological aspects of, of continuity and community. And I know that you um, you think a lot about or your company thinks a lot about the psychological when, especially when you are focusing on your customer more than you are on the product. But I see a lot of people that get way caught up in the mechanics of marketing of, of setting up websites and, and setting up autoresponders and doing all this stuff. And in their mind, they think they're marketing, but that really has very little to do with the marketing. What do you think the balance is if you had to do a percentage wise of the importance of the marketing, the psychological aspect of understanding your customer and defining your customer versus the mechanics of actually ha- having to put it all together? Because both of them are necessary. But, but what do you think the, the most important balance is? Yeah, I mean, a percentage is tough, right? I mean, it's use a baseball analogy. You know, what's more important, the infielders and the outfielders? Um, you know, to use a soccer analogy, the forwards or the goalies, you know, if you don't have one of them, then, you know, you got a, go- you know, greatest goalie in the world sitting back there, you know, trying to score goals all the way across, right? It, so you do need both, but, but I will tell you, uh, the message is preeminent. The message, understanding what your customer actually wants and being able to speak to that and articulate it, that is, that is everything. Uh, and you can have the absolute best uh, you can have the absolute best tactics. You can have the best software, the best everything. Miss on the message and nothing will work. You can have really piss poor tech. You know, you, you could you could have really ugly, funky design. You can have horrible UI on everything, but a great message and people will buy. We've been proof of that, right? We've been we've been proof of that. We've you know we're getting better, um, but we've always invested. Uh, and spend a lot more time on the message and, and frankly, not investing in technology until we knew that the message was going to work. Uh, and, and that served us really well. So if I was going to put a, a percentage at, 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 you know, 80, 20, 90, 10, right. You, you got to have the ability, you got to have enough of the tactics there, but now that's all been so commoditized, right? It's easy for anybody to do. It's super inexpensive um, to go in and be able to do processing, you know, whether you're setting up just a simple Shopify store with a Stripe integration and a, you know, MailChimp or something like that. I mean, you can start selling stuff tomorrow using tech that Amazon could have only dreamed of, you know, in the late nineties. Um, and, and for nothing, like for no money, but if you don't have the right message, if you don't speak to that desired end result, if you don't, you know, if you don't speak the transformational qualities of your product, and, and how after your customer buys it, they're going to be different then the best tech in the world isn't going to work. And, and numerous like big dumb companies have proven that they proved it first during the dot com bust. Um, you know, they're, they're proving it. They're proving it today. Uh, it's always the message. And, and, you know, one thing that you um, have done that is fairly unique from what I've seen is, is you speak uh to the business owners much different than you speak to the service providers or the marketing providers. And the fact that, you know, I, I think recently I saw an email that, that you had out that said this is not for business owners. So you have training, I guess, on both sides, the psychological part, that marketing, that message part. But then you also have training on the mechanics 
of that. And but you're very clear on if you're a business owner, you shouldn't be getting deep in the weeds on this side. You know, give it to your staff, give it to the the, the people that do that part. You focus uh, on uh, your business, which I think is probably tremendously valuable because I've known a lot of really smart business people that have gotten lost in the weeds trying to figure out how to install WordPress, right? Yeah, and I mean, it's uh, it's brutal. Uh, yeah, but and, and I think you make a good point there, really, when, when you know, when I talk about being clear on the market that you serve, um, it's possible and, and, you know, likely that you're going to have multiple, you know, avatars or personas within that market. So let's take, um, you, you know, let, let's take a digital marketer, for example, right? Digital marketer serves in general like digital marketing professionals. Now that's going to take a number of different forms, right? That could take the form of a, you know, marketing professional who's an employee at a company. It could take the form of a marketing executive at a larger company. It could take the form of a marketing agency or consultant. It could take the form of a tr- of a true small business owner, you know, where you're dealing with with a, a business owner that their company is big enough that they're making good sales, but not large enough that they can have their own in-house marketing team. And it can take the form of somebody looking to start a business from scratch, but who recognizes that step one is to get a sale and to get some awareness. Therefore, marketing, you know, you, you kind of need to figure out marketing before you need to figure out accounting. Uh, let's create a reason and something to have something to account for. Um, so within digital marketer, we have these five different avatars. Now, in a perfect world, we would know exactly who these people are. We'd be able to to group them as they come in. But the truth is, is people tend to shift between these different personas. So we don't overcomplicate it. Um, we just say in our emails, we'll call out to certain avatars when it's appropriate. And you know, if we say, hey, this is for agencies only. Well, the business owner doesn't say, well, screw digital marketer. You know, they're clearly not talking to me. They go, oh, okay, no, I appreciate the fact that they serve that market too. And then poof, that message is forgotten, which is exactly what you want to have happen. And when you say this is not for business owners, you know, I think that particular uh, promotion was going out to fill our digital marketing mastery intensive, which is great for marketing professionals, but it's a 12 week class. If you're a business owner, you don't have time. So we mean that. We say, this is not for business owners, but I know in that messaging, business owners are going to open it up. They're going to want to know what's for them. We say, it's not for business owners, but you should put a key marketing person through this class. You know, similarly, we will say with uh, Digital Marketer HQ, which is our kind of flagship level where you know, it's really about team training. We say, this is not for individuals. You know, this is really more for agencies and marketing executives and small business owners. You know, with Digital Marketer Lab, that's kind of the catch-all. So it's good to understand and to have a diverse enough product line in whatever you're doing that you can appeal to all these different personas and avatars within the same market. Where you want to be careful of is not making an offer that people within that market are going to instantly find offensive. Um, we, We found that out the hard way in the tactical space. So we're really big. We have, you know one of the larger companies in the survival preparedness, what really now is becoming more tactical. Um, Not so much like how to go survive in the woods. It's really more of a lifestyle, right? I want to know that I'm prepared, you know, everyday carry kind of stuff. And it's a cool market and a fun market. But what we found is that this particular market crosses all the entire spectrum of the political landscape. You got some of them that are hyper conservative and you got some of them that are like total tree huggers, Right. And if you say into this market, you know, woo Trump, you're going to piss off a whole lot of them. And if you say to this market, Trump sucks, you're going to piss off a lot of that market. And so that's where understanding who do you serve, right? We'll sell you a knife and teach you how to survive in the woods, no matter who you voted for. We don't care, right? Uh, We're not Fox News. So I think that's the critical thing. Defining who you serve, but then, uh, but then understanding the avatars within it and making sure that you don't necessarily, you know, unless you so you can do it intentionally, offend one of those avatars. For digital marketer, we intentionally seek to offend biz op junkies. We make fun of them. <laughs> yeah. Right? We make fun of them. You know, we call them chuckleheads. We call them, you know, shy. we make fun of people who, um, who are just looking for a get rich quick kind of thing. People are like, I want to set this thing up, automate it, and go kick it on the beach. That's what we stand against. So in defining who you stand for, it sometimes is easier to describe what you stand against. 
Now, the one thing that um, clearly you, you feel understanding your customer, understanding who you serve, in your words, is probably uh, one of the most important uh, and most valuable piece of information that a business can have. And I think one thing that's interesting is you not only tell people, you know, here's what you should do, but you've also gone out and said, and here's what you shouldn't do, right? You recently, uh, uh, I read an article by you that uh, talks about the, the, I think it's the five essential but unexpected business lessons learned after five years of running Digital Marketer. And it was really talking about the things that um, newer business should not be focused on, yet it's kind of counterintuitive or, or counter to what a lot of people seem to be drawn to when they first start a business. And I'll, I'll bring up the first one, which I kind of laugh because I see this so often is the stuff that you don't need to have figured out when you get started. And number one on that list was a logo. Oh my gosh. I've seen businesses spend a lot of money, a lot of time trying to perfect their logo. Um, you know, the digital marketer logo has looked utterly ridiculous over the years. Um, I mean, some of them not bad, just not necessarily a fit. Some of them just terrible. I mean, at one point our logo icon was a QR code. Like how lame is that? Um, we had one that, that was designed and I thought was really kind of cool. I think the designer was taking a little too much inspiration from the HubSpot logo and kind of turned it into like a little guy. But what it looked like was an alien with just a, you know, really giant phallus. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't notice it at first, right? Uh, and everybody on the team was like, uh, that's uh, an alien penis. We That should not be our logo. But it was our logo for a couple of weeks. So we're like, Ooh. Um, you know, it, but it never mattered. Again, it's the message um, not, it's not the logo. Nobody cares about it initially. I'm not saying that logos don't matter and that good branding doesn't matter. It does. And you, and you need to focus on it after you've know that you can sell some things. So it does matter. It just doesn't matter day one. You don't have to have it figured out. Um, and, and similarly a business model, you know, a lot of people come in and they're like, well, what's our model? You know, what are we, what are we doing? And going back to what I said, it, don't define your business by the product you sell or the way that you sell it. Define it by the people that you serve. Go into a market intentional saying, we believe we can serve this market. We believe that we have a product that will effectively serve this market, but we are open to them telling us that we're wrong. We're either wrong completely about this product or they would like to, to use the product in a different way. Uh, that's been the story of numerous really, really great uh, business ideas. I mean, Twitter for all their problems you know, the, that, and issues that they're challenges, like I should say, that they're having right now, I give all credit to the founders. You know, they were, I don't even remember what the original product was, but what we know is Twitter today was just kind of a little stupid feature, but they were listening to their customers enough when their customers were like, we like that one. You know, what is this? You know, what, what, is, what is this thing right here? Uh, YouTube, similarly, right? It was originally going to be a, a personals type site. Um, and they realize people are like, I just want to upload videos. Okay, cool. Let's, let's pivot. So listening to your market, not deciding for them what your business model, um, should be. And then thirdly, a team, you know, a team, people say, oh, I'm not, you know, you got to have a rock star team. You know, you got to have this perfect team. I only want A players on my team, man, screw you, right? You're not an A player. Be honest with yourself. Right, really. I mean, if you're there, if you're an entrepreneur, you don't know what the hell you're doing most of the time. I know I didn't. Um, so rally around you people who care, right? Rally around people, you people with empathy, right? People, give me somebody with give a damn and give me somebody with empathy. And I can usually turn them into a pretty decent marketer with enough training and enough time. You know, they can usually become pretty good at what they do. Now, this means that you got to be careful early on that you don't say, you know, you're the CEO and you're the CEO and everybody gets C-level positions because now what you're doing is you're elevating somebody to a role that they haven't yet earned. And when they fail at that role, uh, there's nowhere for them to go. So be very careful early on with titles, right? Be very clear on what somebody should do and what they're responsible for, but be very careful early on with titles. Managers, even director level titles are okay. Because you could put a VP over them, you could put a C-level person over them, a senior VP, all these other things. But in the beginning, just know you're going to get who you get. And the people who are willing to come and work for you know, a dysfunctional, cranky entrepreneur who probably doesn't know what the heck they're doing, you need to, to be thankful that those people got there and, and, and you know, really commit 
to helping them develop into A players. Uh, and, and down the road, you may find that, that they're not prepared to go to the next level with you. And some of these folks you're going to part ways with. Some of these folks, you know, they're going to get their own bosses in the future. But to say that day one, I've got to have a perfect team, if you're not a funded company and, and you don't have all the existing relationships, um, it, it's just a joke. You know, you're, 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 you're kind of being a little bit arrogant to your own abilities and, and your own idea. Uh, to say that day one, you need to have your business model figured out, oh, here's my business plan, and you're chiseling it in stone, you know, it's a joke. It's just not how it happens. To say that day one, we got to have our branding kit. It's got to be perfect, you know, and we're going to invest all this time and money. That, that's not it. Um, you need to be able to say, uh, what's the value that we, that we bring? You know, what, what is the value that we bring? Who do we serve? And how do we articulate that value clearly and concisely to that market. Those are the questions that you, that you need to answer and immediately followed by how am I going to get my first customers at a profit? If you can answer those questions, you're in good shape. And when you talk about YouTube and Twitter, how they uh, adjusted based on what they're cu- listening to their customers, listening to what their customers want. I say in a very simple way that the first rule of marketing, at least in my mind is give them what they want, not what you want them to want. Right. And I think a lot of people are are doing that, um, which which brings me to the point that I want to get into some new stuff that you have going on, because you seem to uh, oftentimes be going the opposite way that uh, the momentum is going with with the market. It seems to be at least for the last few years, people have trying to been figure out, you know, how can I, you know, evolve into part mushroom to where I don't have to talk to anyone, you know, I, where I don't have to um, deal with people. I can live in this digital economy, this digital world, and everything's uh, sold because they press a button and, and pay me. Right. But, Recently, you've been kind of going the opposite way with some of the things that I hear that you're doing, where you're actually doing things that are bringing in more conversations with real people, bringing back a human element to uh, digital marketing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was kind of a funny realization. Um, And, and, you know, I'll tell you that this came about when we got more higher end uh, uh, products and services. So if you're selling, you know, a bunch of widgets and your average customer value is 30 bucks, then, then I'll admit like this, you know, what I'm about to talk about probably isn't going to work. Um, it's not that it won't work. It just may not be, uh, efficient an, an efficient way for you to generate sales. But, you know, if your average customer value is north of a thousand dollars, heck, it might even work depending on, you know, what you bring in. If you're north of $500, um, a year, then this is something that you should really take a look at them. And we figured this out almost accidentally. Um, we first launched Digital Marketer HQ. Uh, so I mentioned Digital Marketer HQ. It's, it's our team training program where you get access to all of the certifications and a manager can go in and assign our certifications to their team members, track their progress, all that stuff. This was the first time that we really spoke to that, that avatar that I mentioned before, kind of the marketing executive and the small business owner. You know, prior to that with our products, it was really more for the do-it-yourselfer, you know, with, with Lab and some of the other trainings. This was the first thing that we did that said, this is designed for, you know, for you to train your team without you having to do it. And so what was amazing is people started emailing us saying, hey, I'd like to check this out. And not just any people, people like marketing executives from Uber, for example, from HarperCollins, from The Economist magazine, um, from Etihad Airlines. I mean, like really big clients and really big brands, people who had been lingering on the outside, looking at what they were doing, liking the content, liking the stuff, but we had never engaged with them directly. And, and furthermore, they didn't necessarily, when we did engage with them, they didn't necessarily want to uh, just go to a website and buy. They wanted to have a conversation. So this happened kind of accidentally. And we said, okay, can we make this happen again? And so then we started sending out emails where the email was not designed, and this is a broadcast, you know, broadcast that might go out through a segment of tens of thousands of people. Um, but the email was not designed to, uh, to get somebody to click a link, go to a website and buy. The email was designed to get someone to reply and to start a conversation, right? Can we start a conversation? Because we found that if we said, hey, call in, less and less people didn't want to pick up the phone and dial in. It's also really inefficient. Um, from, from our perspective, because phones ring in and some of them, you know, aren't necessarily a sales call. But if we 
just tell people, hey, respond, let's start a, a dialogue via email. Well, one person could be maintaining multiple email dialogues. And that's exactly what we did. You know, we sent out an email to a segment. I'll give credit where credit's due. My buddy, Dean Jackson, taught me this strategy. He calls it the nine word email. But we sent out an email to people who had requested information about growing or you know, building an in-house digital marketing team. And the email was simply, uh, are you still looking to, to grow an in-house digital marketing team? That was it. Email went out and people were replying. It, almost instantly they started replying saying, you know, yeah, you know, I am. Thanks so much for getting back to me. Oh, thanks so much for reaching back. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for reminding. And some people were like, you know, no, I'm not, you know, you can take me off of this. Okay. And we respond back. Okay, great. Let us know if there's anything else going on that we can help with. Even in the cases where it didn't turn into a sales conversation, it turned into a human to human touch. And now that person, when they think about our brand is going to think, not about digital market or the nameless, faceless logo, but digital market or that company that they had a real live human interaction with. So we started saying, how can we do this more? How can we build this into, you know, into our overall strategy? And it started with saying, we need to hire not salespeople, but we need to hire customer care people who aren't measured by closing out tickets. So we have our customer care team right now, and we always have, and, and the, you know, the way customer support works at our office is, the way it works everywhere else. People come in saying, you know, I need help with this or my login doesn't work or can you get me this? And their goal is to respond to the tickets, answer, you know, address the issue satisfactorily and then close out the tickets, right? Address the problem, close out the tickets. They're really measured based on tickets closed. We had a thousand come in this week, close out a thousand. Don't let them linger, get an initial response in. What we said is we need a division, a department of our customer care where they're not measured on that. They're measured on how many active conversations do you have going at any given time and are these conversations resulting in sales? And when we did that, it made all the difference in the world. And now we have people selling multi-thousand dollar programs uh, and, and services just via email. Never need to hop on the phone, just somebody saying, yeah, I've been looking at this. I just got a couple of questions answered. Okay, yeah, and you know, if you want to do it, here's, here's a link. You can go get it right now. Let me know if you got any questions. And they go and buy. And, and when and that link you know, is sent to a cart rather than a sales a full sales page or yeah typically it's just here you go there's you know there's a link where you can just go buy I mean they're essentially order takers and people who have more questions and it needs to be sent it up to you know a more trained salesperson um, who primarily is working on the phone then they'll say let me schedule you know you call what are you doing this afternoon and they're booking appointments so they're either closing kind of the lay down order takers or they're 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 teeing them up and sending them and and this worked really well via email. And so we said, well, what other ways can we communicate with our people? Then we started looking at Facebook Messenger, right, and chat. People don't realize, but right now, you can actually build lists that you can broadcast out to inside of Facebook Messenger. You can actually have multiple conversations going with multiple people in your Facebook Messenger, tagging these different conversations, saying this one's closed, this is a potential sale, you know, sending them around. Facebook has now, is now creating really one of the ultimate business chat platforms. Uh, and so our goal now, a key metric that we have here is not just how many unique visitors are we getting to our different pages, but how many unique conversations are starting? How many unique conversations are we starting? Because I believe whether, you know, there is no B2B, there is no B2C, it's all H to H. It's all humans selling other humans. We learned this in the industrial water filter manufacturing space. That's about as in B2B as it gets selling streamlined water filters to desalinization plants, right? But at the end of the day, we had a salesperson, a human being on our team, selling to somebody in procurement, uh, procurement on the, you know, at the desalinization plant, and they had their needs as well. And when you had a human-to-human -human conversation, stuff got done. When you made it automated and robotic and let's put you through this phone tree or let's try to automate every aspect of this conversation, it never worked. It never worked as well as just getting a human to do it. So my old rule has been really for years, if I don't have to do it, it's automated, right? But now I'm, in, I'm a big believer in let's get people you know, in this office who can have conversations. It started with one. Uh, we grew to four, and we're looking at doubling that team uh, here in the next uh, month because the more conversations that we're having at Digital Marketer, uh, the, the, the deeper the relationships and bonds that we're going to be building with our customers. And frankly, the sales that we'll pick up that others won't. 
And I think that's going to give us a pretty distinct competitive advantage. And I think it will give a pretty distinct competitive advantage to uh, other companies that are willing to do that. Yeah, and you're talking about not just in in the digital marketing as far as to, to marketers. You're talking about across all um, uh, uh, fields or industries that you, you deal with. That human-to-human has the same uh, effect or the, the same power across uh, all the fields, correct? Yeah, humans are humans. It really doesn't matter whether we're, you know, whether we're selling to, uh, you know, to digital marketers, you know, and, or even, you know, if, if it's somebody who's got questions about, you know, a large food storage type thing or somebody who's going to make a large um, purchase in the beauty space, it's all, oh, you're always a human in selling to another human. And so, and the simplest way to, to, to connect the dots between the value that you bring in the form of your product or your service to their desired after state, right? That's all we're doing, right? If they're, if they're inquiring about something, it's because they're somewhere and they want to be somewhere else. And they're wondering if your product or service is the vehicle that's going to take them there. That's all selling ever is, is articulating the shift from the before state that they're in right now to the after state they want to be in and how exactly uh, your product is or service is going to make that happen. You can do that via copy, right? You can do that via sales videos. You can do it on webinars. You can do it on stages. That's when we talk about the message, but there's nothing more powerful than doing it one-on-one and asking them, tell me what's going on. You know, why'd you start, you know, what what caused you to look at this today? You know, what's going on in your business or what's going on in your life? Uh, Like you can't always afford to have somebody having one-on-one conversations uh, to sell a really low dollar item, but you can afford it more today when those conversations are happening via chat, you know, or messenger or uh, email. And you can have one person maintaining multiple conversations at the same time, simultaneous sort of conversations. Uh, now it, it actually can work. Whereas before, if it was an enterprise, then you didn't do it because the only means of conversation that both sides were comfortable with was the phone. That's not the case anymore. People will have a conversation via chat or via text message, uh, and it'll feel every bit as real and every bit as intimate as talking to somebody on the phone, for many people even more so. Uh, And and so I think marketers today need to stop asking the question of, how can I automate everything? How can I remove people from this? How How can I make my marketing more robotic, right? And instead ask the question, how can I create more marketing campaigns that drive qualified conversations? Right? How can we create automated campaigns that drive non-automated qualified conversations? That's the question that we're asking. And I think the, uh, I, I think the, the marketers and the business owners that ask a similar question are really going to have an edge uh, as we move in uh, to 2017 and beyond. Well, I, <laughs> I think, you know, first of all, it's you know, remarkable um, information, the, the content that you just uh, – Gave on on that. I think uh, you know proves my premise at the beginning when I talked about you're one of those that bring back maps. You not just explore the unknown or explore and test. You know you you're, you're willing to bring back a map um, for others to be able to take advantage and evolve with that as well. And that seems to be what you've done from the beginning and certainly through the the evolution of digital marketer and, and traffic and conversion um, summits. How can folks find out more? And and, and particularly, I know. Uh, you know, since we talk so much about how important that customer, uh, uh, understanding who you serve, I know you have a customer avatar worksheet uh, out there somewhere. How, how can we find out more about Digital Marker, more about this stuff, and, and for people to start um, taking advantage of the maps that you have? Yeah, we do have a blog post out there. Um, if you just Google customer avatar worksheet, Digital Marketer, uh, you'll find it. Um, and it's just a free blog post, a, a free download. Uh, no opt-in required to do that. Um, if you want to get kind of check out some more of our premium content, um, and, and see what membership is like, um, you know, go to digitalmarketer.com. We, we have digital marketer lab, which is really designed for individuals. Uh, and you can request an invite, uh, to that at, at the top of the digital marketer homepage. And there's also digital marketer HQ, which like I said, is for team trainings. So if you're really anything from, you know, a smaller startup with, with maybe a four or five person uh, sales and marketing team or people, even if it, heck, even if it's an office manager that's doing some social media work, um, then, you know, all the way up to, like I said, Uber, uh, then, then you might want to check out uh, HQ 
and there's a link on to that from the homepage as well. But I think for, you know, where I tell most people to start is, is check out lab. Uh, I'm really proud of the, of the community that we built there, you know, 15,000 of some of the smartest and, and uh, just most generous uh, digital marketers on planet earth, all helping one another out. A lot of the ideas that, that we get, that we, that we teach and talk about come from that community, come from people having breakthroughs and us working with them and saying, Oh man, have you tried this? And, and, and us working together to, to figure this stuff out. So my favorite thing in the world is lab. I, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of our, our oldest and you know, longest running flagship membership. And, and so um, I would, I would check that out as well, but pretty much everything is accessible from the digital marketer homepage. Well, yeah, I, and I highly recommend checking it out. I, I'm a member of Lab myself, and uh, r- really just tremendous information, even to go back and reference, you know, the, from time to time, and always uh, new stuff popping up in there, and really smart folks you have in there uh, uh, providing the training. Uh, I, I got to thank you for, for coming on. I mean, I, you truly are, to me, you know, influencer and innovator for this uh, e-commerce revolution that we're experiencing today, and, and uh, uh, I want to thank you for coming on and, and sharing this uh, information today. Yeah, thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, folks, there you have it. Check it out, digitalmarketer.com. I'll get some links uh, also on the show post that we uh, talked about today. Until next time on Influencers Radio, remember, you are the only real game changer. You've been listening to Influencers Radio. To get all past shows and updates on future shows, visit InfluencersRadio.com today. Or follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Influencers Radio.